Al Shifley began tattooing in Sandusky, Ohio, near Cleveland in 1927. His son Dale picked up the business in 1967 and carried it on until 2000. Al's uh, most colorful contribution was the Sandusky Tattoo Club, modeled after Les Skuse's famous Bristol Tattooing Club in England. Throughout their tattoo careers, both Al and Dale kept full-time day jobs. The fact that they tattoo around day jobs should not lead anyone to think that they were amateurs or half-assed in any way. Far from it. They took their work seriously, had a large and loyal clientele, and were highly respected by their peers and customers. The Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Company was in operation for a whopping eight years when Al Shifley was born, January 17, 1911, to father Frederick Shifley, a laborer and city worker, and mother Valerie, a French immigrant. Al would become the eldest of nine siblings. The family resided at 1501 West Market Street in Sandusky, Ohio. According to his son Dale, Al Shifley's interest in tattooing began with receiving a tattoo from a carnival artist at the age of 12 or 13 in the local, local summer fair. As with a lot of us, his parents weren't too happy. The tattoo artist's name at present is unknown and may be lost to time. According to Dale Shifley, in the off season, the artist resided in Fremont, Ohio, approximately 30 miles from Sandusky. This is also the person who gave Al Shifley his start in tattooing. Al found out this guy, quote, was selling him equipment and ink that he wouldn't use himself. You know what I mean, unquote, Dale said. Quote, he was dumping all the junk off on my dad, unquote. In 1927, at the age of 15, Al started tattooing professionally from his parents' residence, using his bedroom as his studio. According to the U.S. 1930 census, Al was working in the packing house of J.H. Ruth Pork Products. He was a fortunate young man to be working during the Depression. Going through Al's scrapbooks, photo albums, and letters show that in the early 30s he started corresponding heavily with several suppliers. Among them were Professor Charles Wagner, E.J. Miller, and Percy Waters. On November 24, 1934, he married Theta Lewis and moved to 1513 Pearl Street, Sandusky, where they rented from Al's mother. Later on, they bought the home. His tattoo shop was a separate building in their backyard. Al worked full-time as a conductor for the Pennsylvania Railroad, taking the night shift to allow for his seven days a week tattoo shop hours. Al's tattoo studio was open five to nine on weekdays, 10 to nine on Saturday, and one to nine on Sunday. Al also bought and sold guns. The correspondence during these years appeared to be straight ahead business. Correspondence with Charlie Wagner dated December 4th, 1937 reads, Dear Mr. Shifley, the cost for the three machines you desire will be $5 and 50 cents a jar for inks or four ounce for $1. Yours very truly, Charlie Wagner. P.S. Design sheets are 50 cents. The next correspondence I found was from Cap Coleman, dated August 2nd, 1943. Again, it's straightforward business, but it also shows the kinship that existed among tattoo artists of the day. Glad to know you received the bag okay. Brown is $2 a quarter pound, $3 a half pound. As I advise, you use storage batteries to run the machines. Machines run better and you can do better work. Transformer, no good. You put the machines on the bum with that transformer. Machines are adjusted for batteries. With the transformer, you're using AC current. The machines require DC current. You get it from batteries. I use batteries myself. All good tattoo work is done with batteries, not transformer. Coleman, PS, charge them plenty for your work. The 1950s would prove to be a very exciting decade for Al Shifley. Dale remembers his father remodeling the shop in 1953. Nine years old at the time, Dale helped by staining the frames that would display the commercial design sheets that Al Shifley and Mac McCullen collaborated on. The design sheets were printed from negatives on photo paper. 
where the originals are is anyone's guess. Sandusky has always been a vacation spot, so in the summer, the Shifleys sold lawn ornaments to supplement their income. Theo has fond recollections of traveling to Cleveland to buy these lawn ornaments from Cleveland businessman E.B. Newman. According to Dale, Newman had seen a bit in the newspaper about Les Cuse, a British tattoo artist and president of the Bristol Tattooing Club. Al started corresponding with Les in 1953. They became fast friends. Al knew a good idea when he saw one and started the Sandusky Tattoo Club in November of 1954. In 1955, he traveled to England to be the guest of honor at the Bristol Tattooing Club's unique party. At a pub called the Cornish Mount in Pennywell Road, Bristol, on the flight over, Dale said Al read an article on racehorses being stolen and the new practice of tattooing identifying marks inside their lips. Dale quoted his father as saying, quote, if horses, why not people, unquote. In 1956, Al organized what I would describe as a first modern tattoo convention. The guest of honor was Les Cuse. Milt Zeiss came, as did Paul Rogers. Huck Spaulding and members of the Sandusky Tattoo Club. Dale recalls Paul Rogers in 1956 describing him as very athletic. Quote, I watched him walk the whole backyard on his hands, unquote, Dale said. In 1957, Al Shifley and Milt Zeiss were the guests of honors at another Bristol Tattooing Club unique party. Al's wife accompanied him. In the early Spalding and Rogers promotional flyer, there are endorsements from Al and Les with photos of Les being presented the, with design sheets and machines at this party. In October 1960, Al would again be one of the guests of honor at the eighth anniversary of the Bristol Tattooing Club. Joining him was Huck Spalding as the second guest of honor. In a recent interview, Danny Skuse described Al Shifley as a quote, a gentleman's gentleman. During this same time period, Al stayed in close contact with Paul Rogers and Huck Spaulding and visited their Fayetteville, North Carolina shop. On one of these visits in the mid-50s, Huck Spaulding tattooed Al Shifley's back with an exquisite Coleman-style crucifixion. He did the job start to finish, Dale said, in quote, seven hours and 40 minutes, unquote. It was rock-solid tattoo work by anyone's standards. Al's phone book from the 50s and 60s reads like a who's who of the tattoo world. With way too many names and addresses to list, among the American tattoo artists he stayed in touch with were Crazy Philadelphia Eddie Funk, Jack Dracula, Sailor Eddie, Phil Sparrow, and Carl Bumpus. British tattoo artists he knew, Cash Cooper, Jack Zeke, Rich Mingans, Bob Madison, and of course, Les Cuse. He also kept in touch with Doc Forbes in Canada, European artists like Denmark's Tattoo Isle, and Holland's Tattoo Peter DeHaan. There are neat little notes here and there in his phone book like, quote, New Yellow, with an arrow pointing to Stanley Maskowitz's address. See Bill Skuse for this green, and other notes on different chemical companies that sold dry pigments. Al Sundale received his first tattoo the day he graduated from high school, June 6, 1963. His name Dale on the inside of his lower lip. Quote, the thing about it was though, see, my dad wouldn't tattoo me until the day I graduated from school, Dale said. Quote, that's why I know exactly that date was June 6, 1963, because that was the day I graduated from school. So my dad said, okay, pick out whatever design you want and I'll tattoo it, Dale said. I told him my name on my lip. That's what I wanted. And he couldn't believe it, but that's what I wanted, so he did it. The thing about it was when you do it, it always felt like you had snuff or something in. And my dad always said, don't put your tongue in there or you'll force the ink out. Well, I did that. And the third time my dad redid it, I went in the house and said, Mom, Mom, can you see my name? She said, no, pull down your lip. And I said, well, if you can't see it this way, I'm okay then. 
Dale married his wife Carol in 1963 and was hired by the Ford Motor Company in November of the same year. In 1967, Al started teaching Dale to tattoo. He wanted to teach me earlier, Dale said, but I guess I just wasn't ready because he always said, well, when you start to settle down, that's when we'll get serious. I had other things on my mind, I guess. The same year, Al suffered a stroke from which he would never fully recover. Al and Dale worked the shop together until 1971. Quote, the tattooing with my father and myself was always a hobby more than a livelihood, Dale said. Because through the winter time, there would be lots of times that you would go maybe a month, month and a half in the early 70s that you wouldn't do any work whatsoever. So it was just something that you couldn't rely on. So my dad had a full-time job and I had a full-time job. And I've always stated that the tattooing with me was always a hobby. It was never a job. I never considered it a job because I always figured a job is something that you want to go and get done and go and do something that you wanted to do. So that's why I always considered it a well-paying hobby. The same year they changed the name of the studio to Father and Son Tattooing. Due to Al's deteriorating health, he retired from tattooing in the middle of 1971. Dale continued to work the shop, modeling himself after his father by working a full-time job and using the money from tattooing to supplement his mom and dad's income. On May 25, 1973, Al passed away from a massive heart attack. In June 1973, Dale moved the studio to 1508 Taylor Street. Talking to Dale, it seems like he kept to himself for the most part. He did, however, contact Marty Holcomb at least six times to make appointments to go down and get work from Marty in Columbus, Ohio. Dale speaks very highly of Marty Holcomb. In 1976, Dale attended the first national convention in Houston. The city didn't care much for the neighborhood around the hotel, but he did enjoy himself. He has fond memories of talking with Lyle Tuttle and said, he was always a hell of a nice guy. I asked Dale if he felt uh, the shift in the late 70s and early to find blind single needle work. My customers stayed pretty much the same, he said. If someone wanted fine line, I'd do it, but the majority of the people who I was still tattooing wanted traditional stuff. You know, I didn't get into much like the armbands or sleeves or stuff like that. It was just basically the single tattoo, you know. Dale's business picked up in the 80s and he continued to supplement his mother's income through his tattooing until her death in 1987. His best years money-wise were right before I quit, he said, in the early to mid 90s. The year previous to the year that I decided I was going to retire, I had a hell of a good year, he said. It was hard in one sense to give it up, you know. Then again, I just got burned out. Dale worked the Taylor Street location until he retired from tattooing in 2000. Dale retired from 40 plus years at the Ford Motor Company and ended a 23 year career in tattooing. Toward the end of one of my interviews with Dale, I asked if tattooing had been good to him. Yeah, he said with a warm chuckle, oh yeah.